Okay, hello everybody for those of you on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And of course on Rumble, and hello for those of you on Spreaker. So Twitter's over here, and you guys are over here. Yeah, we had just, uh, uh, I was doing fine just a minute ago, but man, the allergies just really started kicking my rear in. Uh, right before I went on uh, live, I was like, good grief. <clears throat> man, so hopefully uh, it'll calm down. It's one of those uh, allergies have been terrible. They are terrible. I don't know where you are in the world, but hopefully, um, <clears throat> man, hopefully you're not, it's not kicking your butt like it's kicking mine. All right. A couple of things before we get into the presentation, everybody. I'm Bishop James Long. Hello and welcome. And thank you for being here. And uh, if you want to go to my website, it's very simple. Bishopjameslong.com. There you go. Bishopjameslong.com. Really, the only the most important thing you need to, to, to do is just to scroll, really scroll past the, the ugly picture as fast as you can. Just scroll down and scroll all the way down to where it says night prayer. And if you click on that night prayer link, it'll take you to night prayer tonight. Night prayer, by the way, is at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You know, a lot of us ask us to pray for your petitions. We love doing that. Uh, but do us a favor. Join us for night prayer. We would love to have you. So we start music around 948 p.m. Eastern Standard. And then, of course, our uh, we actually start at 10 p.m. praying. Okay. It's the same. Oh, hello, Denmark. Hello, everybody. It's the same prayer that we, I prayed when I was the uh, when I was in the seminary with the Roman seminary. So, oh, it's uh, 1 a.m. in England. Wow. Well, we appreciate all of you guys being here. <laughs> our, our bishop is quite dashing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I took a shower today. Today, though, I'm in Kentucky, so we take once a week. Once a week. That's it. Once a week. And uh, just, uh, but uh, no, I went down to the creek, as they say. I went down to the creek. That's the creek, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about. All right. Uh, a couple things before we get into this. Uh, if you want to go to the church's website, usocc.org. Uh, that is the website uh, to check us out. We are working on a couple of uh, things, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Of course, we're working on our retreat for next year. Uh, so, uh, you know, th that, that takes some time. So once we get the retreat all up and running and scheduled and things of this nature, we open it up to the public. So we'll let you know and uh, and go from there. Yeah, on Rumble. Don't know what, what she has. Oh, on Rumble? No, no. Uh, night prayer is only on Katrina. Night prayer is uh, or Katarina. I'm sorry. Katarina, uh, night prayer is only on Spreaker. So you have to go to bishopjameslong.com. Scroll all the way down. Yeah, and, and, and to click on the speaker, it takes you there. <clears throat> okay, so there we there we go. Now, uh, by the way, oh, let me just double check real quick. I know this is Bible study, but I have to. A lot of you also watch the shows on Friday. Let me just check. Hold on. <clears throat> Come on, I don't want to do that. Just. <sighs> They always make things so complicated. I don't want to set up a pen. Just, no, I don't want to set up a pen. Just let me see my stupid account. I t they're always making things so difficult, always. But anyway, we're going to check to see. Uh, it doesn't, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. I go to the church page, uh, usocc.org. We're going to have information there, and uh, it'll be there. I'm trying to find something here. But they always make things so complicated. Okay. All right. So here's the deal with uh, the show this Friday. Uh, it doesn't look like I'll be live at uh, the Ashmore States. Uh, they are having some internet issues. Uh, they use Starlink. And apparently they had some storms. And so uh, because they had some pretty bad storms, they're having some issues there. And so I just want to give you a heads up this Friday. I'll be here live in the studio and uh, that way you'll know. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things. It's uh, just one of those. And I know this is, this is the paranormal Friday show, but anyway, a lot of you watch the paranormal show. So uh, this Friday, it looks like we'll be here uh, because uh, they, they just, they have no internet. And so, and, and, and he said that it might take until tomorrow for him to, uh, to go out there. But by that time, it's just going to be too late uh, because, you know, we have to, you know, all the, all the, all the expenses that come with it. So anyway, I just want to give you guys a heads up on that. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, let's get into our Bible study for the day. Yeah, for some reason, I had a major allergy attack. I mean, I was coughing my head off. I just had a meeting uh, right before uh, Bible study, and as soon as the meeting was over, I was like, man. <clears throat> so I've been, whew. Okay. And thank you to JMB. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Our, our first reading is Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 8 through 12. So Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. Okay. That's our first reading. And we'll, we'll see. Well, right now, everybody seems to be acting nice on TikTok. Hopefully, it stays that way. If it is, we'll just, we'll just leave the chat as it is. Uh, but it, it, look, it, here's the deal, uh, moderators. If if there's a lot of people coming in and trolling and all that, it, we'll just put sub chat only. You know, matter of fact, do I have sub chat only? Nope, it's all it's uh, it's uh, available for everybody right now. So we'll see, we'll see if everybody just behave. Isn't it terrible you have to say this? Well, you have to, you have to. It's just you know. Um. Yeah, I agree, Andy. I agree. Acts chapter four, verse eight through twelve. Everybody. Okay, it says here, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answered them, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely, by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. In his name, this man stands before you healed. He is the, uh, the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. There's no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. And if we are mass, we say the word of the Lord. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I take allergies. I, I, I didn't have any problems. I was, I was fine with allergies today. And then as soon as I just got off the uh, uh, a meeting, it just hit me like, goodness gracious, that was crazy. Okay, and now, so let me give you some background to this one. As Peter and John spoke to the people at Solomon's uh, portico last uh, last week, if you remember, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. So the teaching of uh, Peter and John upset them because the apostles were teaching that in Jesus' name there was resurrection of the dead. That was a doctrine specifically rejected by the Sadducees. So you need to understand that, right? So the Sadducees firmly rejected this teaching. And so and they, they were the leaders. And so Peter and John were seized. They were arrested. And they were held overnight in jail. So meanwhile, the numbers of men who believed grew to 5,000. And the next day, Peter and John were brought, uh, brought before the Sanhedrin. And so what we hear today is Peter's address to the Sanhedrin. It is an apology of the faith rather than a sermon. An apology doesn't mean, oh, I'm so sorry. That's a, <laughs> it's an explanation uh, of the faith. Uh, after this address to the Sanhedrin, Peter and John were released. <clears throat> so, uh, pretty powerful. It says here, uh, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answered them. Now recall that in Luke chapter 12, verse 11 through 12, Jesus says, When you are brought before the synagogues, Rulers and authorities do not worry about how you would defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what you should say. That's see, this is so powerful when you read verses like this, and, and you and then you can look at another verse to see that this prophecy, as Jesus said, was fulfilled. And it certainly was. Now, so he says, leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely by what means he was saved. So the focus, the focus seems to have changed from resurrection to healing, but not really. See, the apostles display the power of the resurrected Lord, as we will see. So he's saying, look, if, we're, if, if you're going to, to, to put us here in, in, in a trial because of a good deed that we did in the name of Christ, so he and they have a very valid point. So if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the uh, people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Remember, the name is the person. 
and all that he represents. Whom you crucified. So now they're throwing it right back in their face. Whom God raised from the dead. Not them, but God raised from the dead. That's resurrection. And in his name. So this person, the name Jesus, has power through which he allows others to work miracles and accomplish great things. So in his name, this man stands before you healed. They couldn't deny it. So the man, the, the man, the crippled man who has been healed is a visible proof of the power is standing in their midst. So we're not doing paranormal stuff today. This is this is Bible study. There. Sub chat only, folks. Okay. So anyway, uh, for those of you on TikTok, if you like to subscribe to the channel, you're certainly welcome to do so. But right now, sub chat only for Bible study. This is not Paranormal Friday. Anyway, so there's the proof right there. So the proof is in the pudding, as the old as the old saying goes. So they can't they can't. What are they What are they What are they accusing them of? Healing a man in the name of Christ? Well, okay. So you're going to say that we're evil? Well, here's a man right here. He's healed right in front of you. And verse eleven, then it says, "He is, he is the stone rejected by you." The builders, which has come become the cornerstone. So Peter is addressing the religious leaders of the community and actually quotes them Psalms 118, verse 22. And that's actually the Passover meal. It's the it's the third and fourth cups of the Passover meal that just a few days earlier. And some translators render this as capstone rather than cornerstone. Now, what this that's Psalm 118. He's he's quoting Psalms. And verse 12, there is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. So the psalm says that we are to rejoice, and this is why. You see, the Messiah has arrived and opened heaven so that salvation is possible. No longer are the souls trapped in Sheol, so they can enter into heaven, you know, in anticipation of, of the resurrection. And I just find it fascinating that... Um, and they were released. You know, that, that's, what's, that's what's really even more interesting is they were released. And people say, well, there's no proof that Jesus rose from the dead or there's no proof. All this. Stuff. OK, the Sanhedrin would not have released them if it was a fraud. If this guy wasn't legitimately healed, the Sanhedrin would say, you're a liar. You're a deceiver. This man is not healed. You are using Jesus's name and this man is not healed. And they would have been put to death. But they weren't. They were released. Because they could not use this man against them because they are seeing, in fact, that he was healed in the name of Jesus. So everything that they're saying is 100% true. So what can they accuse them of? And I, I think it's a, again, it's, it's a very powerful, very powerful story. When it, It's a reminder, I think, for all of us that when Jesus told, and this is for all of you, when someone comes to you, and they're asking you for your for their, your help, for your guidance, for your prayers. Don't worry about what to say. If you speak to them out of love, then the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. And this is what Jesus reminds the disciples. He reminds all of us. Have faith in God and that when you have these times, and, and you will, and when you have those difficulties or, or when someone comes to you and they want to, they want to chat with you about some struggles that they're going through, you don't have to have all the answers. I have learned that uh, being, you know, being in ministry for a long time, I've been, you don't have to have all the answers. Just the fact that you're there, the fact that you're willing to listen, the fact that you show compassion, for many people, that's enough. All right, uh, our second reading, uh, let's get into it, is 1 John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 2. Well, hello there from Cincinnati, Ohio. <clears throat> Yeah, and hello to all you guys. I appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for taking the time on this beautiful Wednesday and uh, chatting with us on uh, on Bible study. Yeah, I, hopefully I'll be able to push through uh, all the way for, for the night until 930 because, uh, like I said, right before I just had a horrible allergy attack. It was like good grief. So coughed my head off, but we're pushing through it. We're pushing through it. First John. First John chapter 3. Verses 1 through two. Yeah, it's not a very long one. 
But now Ms. Wilma, she's going to be teaching Bible study, by the way. She'll be teaching uh, Bible study on Sunday. I'm sure she'll have 15 pages. I'm telling you, she does. She, it, it takes her all week long because what she does, Ms. Wilma, God love her, but she will write and write and write. And I'll, I'll call her and say, what are you doing? I'm still writing. I'm like, How many pages do you have? Oh, I have about 10 pages. And then I'm saying, Wilma, it's the one, the, there was one time, it's like, Jesus wept. And you have 10 pages on that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just, you know. <laughs> so, oh, you have a joke? Okay, great, you have to let her know. Yeah, she would love that. <clears throat> okay, First uh, John. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet, so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do not know that when it is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see him as he is. And if we are mass, we'd say the word of the Lord. Okay, so let me explain this one. It's not very, not, like I said, it's not a long reading at all. Uh, having taught about repentance, by the way, which is important, and reordering uh, of our lives to follow our Father's plan, John now teaches what it means to be a part of God's covenant family. I've talked about this before. The idea that we don't have to repent. Anyone who teaches you that repentance is not necessary, you, you, you know what? You walk away from them. Seriously, walk away. Don't, don't entertain them. Don't listen to them. If they tell you you do not have to repent for your sin, that is absolutely not biblical. As a matter of fact, I think it goes, every, it goes against what the Bible says in many books. So re repentance is a very big part of the, being a Christian. Because it reminds that we all, we have to be humble before God. And so there's a lot of people, oh, no, 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 you don't have to. No, no, walk away. I, I don't know. I don't know where people get the idea. I think it goes, it goes back, honestly, it goes back to universal salvation. So where no matter what you do, no matter what you say, you're not going to lose your salvation. That's what universal salvation means. Everybody is going to be universally saved whether you like it or not. And I just, I disagree with that. I just do. So um, <clears throat> now, uh, affirming the present reality of God's love in making the Christians children of God, it has three consequences. So Christians, first, Christians do not belong to the world. Which, by the way, the world failed to receive Jesus because the world has rejected Jesus. Even today, people reject Jesus. Two, Christians will leave lives in holiness, like Christ. That is what we're supposed to do every day. And three, uh, Christians are confident of an even greater salvation in the future. Yep, absolutely. So I think, you know, we understand this as Christians. And we understand that the world tells us you don't need Jesus. You can do it on your own. You don't need a Savior. You can do that on your own. And I'm telling you that anyone who tells you that uh, is misleading you. We do need a Savior. And thank God that we have one. But there's a lot of people that want to spread that 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 blasphemy, and that's what it is. You know, there's a lot of belief in there, especially in the world. The world says this. The world says, follow your heart. But Jesus never said that. Jesus told us, follow me. There, there's people say, be true to yourself. Okay, they say, well, Jesus said, be true to yourself. Well, yeah, we have to be true to ourselves, and I think that's fair, but Jesus never said that. Jesus never said, be true to yourself. I don't know where, where, where people are getting this stuff. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. A lot of people say, um, Jesus said, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. You can do it. You don't... See, this is the world. The world is telling us, follow your heart. Now, that's, that's good advice, but, we, but Jesus said, follow me. So, yeah, we have to follow our heart and we have to make decisions. But that doesn't mean to exclude Jesus. 
Jesus never said, be true to yourself. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. People say that Jesus said, uh, believe, in your, believe in yourself. Jesus said, nope, believe in me. People said, uh, this, is a, this is a new one. This is a new one. People say that Jesus said, live your truth. That's a new, I don't know, a new world kind of a, a world theology. I don't know. Live your truth. That's what Jesus said. Live your truth. No, Jesus did not say that. Jesus said, I am the truth. And then people say, well, they'll say, well, Jesus said, as long as you're happy, as long as you're happy. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his soul? We have this, uh, we have this horrible ideology these days where it's all about forget about God and focus all about ourselves. It's all about us. And I, I, I firmly believe, firmly reject that type of theology. There's nothing wrong with someone saying, hey, you know, believe in yourself and, and have faith in yourself. You can do it. Be true to yourself. That's good. But Jesus did never said those things. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, you're right. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18, meism. So, okay, First John chapter 3, verse 1 through 2. Let me explain this. Uh, it says, see what the love of the Father, see what the love of the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet, so we are. You know, as in the Beatitudes, to be called is to be called by God. So in the language of the Bible, when God gives someone a name, He's not simply conferring a title or means of identification, but is causing the thing which the name indicates. So the, the word of God is, is uh, efficacious. It does, it, it does what it says it will do. And this is why St. John adds, yet so we are. It's not a metaphorical title, uh, uh, a legal fiction or uh, adoption human style kind of a thing. God has gratuitously given us a strictly supernatural dignity and intimacy with God, whereby we are members of his household with the right of inheritance. Please understand that. <clears throat> we, we, are not, uh, we are not adopted redheaded stepchildren. It's not what we are. We are actually members of God's household. with the right of inheritance, eternal kingdom. And a lot of people choose to reject God's household, and that is their right. I mean, and, and they, that, that's, there's nothing, if they want to do that, that is their right. Of course, it's stupid, uh, but, but they do. How many people have done that? How many have, you see it today. People are mocking Jesus all the time. All the time, I see this constantly, and they think it's funny, and they think, "No, wait, I don't need Jesus. I can do it for my own. I can do this on my own." I don't, or, or we are little gods. I'm hearing that a lot. I hear that all the time. We are little gods that we we don't need uh, a, a god to to overlook us or lord over us. But seriously, that's what people are saying now. <clears throat> it's insane. Uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. Is that what you ask? Yeah, they are. They're, they're saying that we are little gods. I mean, that, that's, that's a blasphemy at an extreme level. But that's what's being taught. That is what's being taught in, in, in today's world. And so it, it's, it's disgusting and it's disturbing. <clears throat> Uh, what's the difference between? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, allergies are killing me. My goodness. So um, Andy is asking, what is the difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees? The Pharisees and Sadducees, they were two prominent Jewish groups. And that, that was uh, especially during the time of Jesus in the first century. 
uh, in the belief system, the Pharisees, they were a religious, gr like a group. Uh, they were known for their very strict adherence to Jewish law and traditions. Uh, they believed in the resurrection of the dead, the angels, and the existence of the soul beyond death. But the Sadducees, on the other hand, they were a more, they were more aristocratic. Uh, they, uh, that was primarily concerned with the temple rituals and maintaining power. That was their focus. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead or the angels or the afterlife. This is why the Sadducees were very upset with Peter and John, because Peter and John were preaching about the resurrection. Now that wouldn't affect it. That wouldn't upset the Pharisees about the resurrection. The Pharisees would have got upset because they were talking about Jesus raising people from the dead. Uh, the the Pharisees uh, derived their authority from the interpretation of the Torah and the oral uh, traditions. Uh, they were seen as the experts, like in um, religious matters. They were respected. The, a lot of the common people respected. I think the Pharisee the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They were associated with the uh, priestly class. They derived their authority from their positions in the temple hierarchy. So they they like to be waited on. They were those type of people. Kiss my kiss my ring. That type of people. Um, the Pharisees generally uh, they they opposed the Roman rule, and they urged the fellow Jews and to adhere strictly to Jewish laws and customs. And so they wouldn't lose their identity. Well, the Sadducees, they were more accommodating to the Roman rule, and they actually worked with them and the Roman authorities to, to maintain peace. Now, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, they had a very strong influence on Jewish religious life. And they certainly were very popular uh, with their teachings uh, and the uh, interpretations of the Torah. But the, the, the Sadducees, they held more political power. Yeah, particularly within the temple structure. Uh, but after, by the way, the, the temple destruction, when the temple, uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 a uh, AD, it, their, their power waned. So, uh, no, 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 no. He was, no, no, no. The, that, these are Jewish. These are Jewish. The Pharisees and the, uh, and the Sadducees are Jewish. Uh, Caesar was uh, Roman. Okay, <clears throat> that's why that's why Caesar really didn't care uh, in the in the beginning about you know them calling Jesus the Messiah because Caesar was like okay whatever you know like you guys you, you think your Messiah is coming Caesar, I mean Caesar uh, had pagan gods so Caesar believed Caesar believed in multiple gods uh, and it, even uh, Pontius Pilate uh, Pilate really didn't care I mean, you know I'm sorry Pilate when when, G, when they brought uh, Jesus in front of Pilate he was like okay oh, whatever he didn't want to be bothered with it he just didn't want to be troubled with it. Uh, because he thought these were just religious zealots being crazy. Uh, he didn't. He did not. He did not uh, subscribe to their ideology when it comes to to, to the Yahweh. Uh, and that's what uh, Pontius Pilate. He was Roman. Okay, so we're talking about so so see what uh, see what love the Father has bestowed on us that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. So again, we are actually God's household. And it continues, uh, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And this calls to mind Jesus' words at the Last Supper. The hour is coming. Whoever kills you, you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do this because they have not known the Father or me. John chapter 16, verse 2 through 3. And verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall have, what we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So although we know that we are God's children, and we are, we have not fully experienced it yet, because the seeds of divine life, which it contains, will only reach their full growth in eternal life. So when we see him, Christ, as he is face to face, when we do see the God face to face, it will be a beautiful, this relationship that we will finally see our Father in heaven, it will be unbelievably unique. And we have to remember, again, we are not uh, you know, when we think about uh, children of God, we kind of think sometimes, well, he kind of, you know, he's kind of like um, a step. <laughs> no, no, you can't think that. You can't think that way at all. 
we are actually God's children. And we will be uh, one day resting peacefully in heaven. And I think it's so sad that so many people have returned, rejected that. And God allows. See, the relationship that God offers us is a relationship out of love. And says, I want you to be my children. I will be your father. I will take care of you. I will protect you. I will grant you eternal life. But God does not force anyone into his household. No one. Although he wishes everyone does enter into his household, he doesn't force that relationship with anyone. Hence, that's why hell exists. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. Okay, that's our gospel reading. So I'll give you a little bit of time to open your Bibles. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. Yeah, it's, it, it, it really is free will. I can't understand why anybody would turn uh, that relationship away, but they, they do. And I think it's because they have such a distorted view on, on Christianity. You know, perhaps maybe it's because of, you know, their upbringing or their personal life experience. And I can understand that, but then they have to put the responsibility where it lies and not on Jesus, because Jesus did not do that. Jesus, his whole entire ministry is about love and compassion. I know. I agree, Andy. Andy, uh, Andy says it makes me so angry when they mock uh, my Savior. It's true. There's a lot of people on social media. I was scrolling through today, and so many people saying some really nasty, vulgar things. I thought, my gosh, well, you, you, there's so much hatred, so much hatred. It's sad. Okay, John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. It says here, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay, has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know mine and mine know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I will lay, my, uh, lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. And if we were at Mass, we'd say the gospel of the Lord. That's a powerful, a powerful, powerful reading there, isn't it? I think a lot, uh, we have a lot of pastors. We have a lot of wolf in sheep's clothing today. A lot of pastors today. Because they're preaching this prosperity gospel. They're preaching this uh, feel-good theology that, oh, let's not talk about hell. Let's not talk about the existence of hell. Let's not talk about the consequences of our behavior. Let's talk about no matter what you do, once saved, always saved, and you're going to go to heaven whether you like it or not. I just reject that theology. I reject it. We have to be careful about preaching that type of theology. By the way, this Sunday, for those of you who don't know, thank you very much, Andy. <clears throat> this Sunday is often called the Good Shepherd Sunday because of this reading. See, in the ancient Middle East, uh, shepherds did not drive their sheep. They, they, they led them. And the sheep were very close to the shepherd, almost like pets. They knew the voice of their own shepherd, and they would only follow them. So the shepherd led them to food and water. He protected them for, from predators, and he searched for them when they were lost. And Jesus is our good shepherd. He provides for us, protects us, saves us from danger. And this is, a, this is one of the things uh, I have noticed also. A lot of people who are anti-Christian will use this reading and say, I refuse to be a stupid sheep just following around people. You, you want to be sheeple? That term they use, sheeple. Uh, people who don't think on their own, people who do not uh, rationalize, people who just it, just follow blindly. See, this is what they're using. So they're twisting and turning this theology and trying to make it sound like you're the ignorant one because you're just nothing but a bunch of sheep following this man that existed 2,000 years ago. And the church tells you that he's Jesus, the Messiah. See, this is what people are using. 
and and because it is filled with emotion and it's and people don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage of or that they're being abused or they're be, that they're they're just mindless creatures wandering around like stupid sheep. And then they say, well, yeah, you know, what's a good point. I don't want to be a dumb sheep. I just want to follow blindly. See, this is what this is what people are using. This, this is the stuff that I pay very close attention to when I see people who are atheist, people who are Satanist, people who are Luciferians. They will always use this argument. You're, you're just a bunch of sheeple. You're just a bunch of people running around like sheep, not thinking for yourself. Because that is filled with so much emotion that it, it, it is purposely driven to make you think that you're just blindly and foolishly following some man that existed 2,000 years ago. But see, they don't understand the analogy, do they? Because they are they don't belong to the good shepherd. I don't look at this. I'm not a stupid, dumb sheep that just blindly follows the my, my good shepherd. That's not the point. It, it's an analogy. It is an analogy. He Christ is saying that people who are mine hear my voice, I hear their voice. That I will lay my life down. That people who are running like I again, we'll, we'll break it down. Let me explain it to you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. I am the good shepherd. So this is uh, this is good in the sense of uh, like a noble ideal. Rather than being good at something, he is the perfect shepherd. Is what he's saying. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A perfect, a true shepherd. It's not an exaggeration to fit the occasion. See, the, uh, the Israelite shepherd frequently risked his own life to save his sheep. Uh, it is it, it, In a far more significant, significant way, Jesus laid down his life for the sheep of God, for us, children of God. So, in, 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 uh, And they would understand this, certainly in Jesus' time. A good shepherd would go hand in hand and, and fight off wolves with whatever weapons they have to protect the sheep. And even to the point of putting themselves in between the wolf and the sheep at great peril. At great peril. Just enough, the, 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 enough time to get the sheep to run away. And, and he explains this in verse 12. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own. Sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay, has no concern for the sheep. And let me tell you something, verse 12 and 13 right here. For anybody who are clergy, there are so many people who are playing church today. There are so many people who use the term pastor and they don't give a darn for the people that they are shepherding. They care about money. They care about power. They care about authority and they care about materialism. But in the end, they are serving the God of Satan, the God of lust, the God of hate, the God of condemnation. You cannot serve two masters. See, a man who is just hired and does it just for the money, just for the bucks, just for the fame, just for the power and authority, that is an individual who is dangerous to God's people. Because they preach. A lot of these pastors are preaching this these theology that's very dangerous. And not only are they preaching theology that's dangerous, but it is misleading the people of God. And the people of God, then are saying, well, that makes sense, and that makes sense. And then they're, what they're doing is they're twisting theology all the way around, even to the point saying that Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. There are pastors that preach this, folks. Now, you, you, please explain that to me if you can. Please explain that to me. How can any pastor say that Jesus did not have to die on the cross? That, Jesus said it a hundred million times. That was what he was supposed to do. That was his mission. He said it over and over and over again. So to preach that Jesus did not have to die on the cross. Now, folks, I don't understand that theology. This is very dangerous, very dangerous theology to teach. So remember, a hired man 
who's not a shepherd, whose sheep is not his own, sees a wolf coming, and what does he do? He runs away. Oh, well, you're on your own now. I'm working for pay. I'm not here. To, I'm not going to lay my da life down off for you. Bye. See you. The wolf catches and scatters them. It's the same principle. But go deeper. Let's go deeper in theology here. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper. A pastor is supposed to be one who stands in between and stands firm toe-to-toe -to -toe with the people that he is pastoring. And if he sees a demon coming, if he sees the devil coming, he will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and say, I'm not running from you, demon. I'm not gonna, you're not gonna make me afraid, and I'm not gonna I'm, you're not, I'm not gonna be scattered. I'm not gonna I will stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, and I will protect the people that I preach the good news to. And that thing, if that means that I have to lay my life down, then so be it by God I will, because I'm not going to allow you to hurt them. See, the wolf represents so much more than just a literal wolf. It also represents so many other things. False theology, demonic activity, fake preachers. All these people pretend to be something that they're not. Deep theology here. Now, so and remember, he was talking specifically like the Pharisees who have no personal commitment to the welfare of the Jews. They work only for their own interests. This was a direct smack right in the face to them. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. And I know mine and mine know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father and I will lay my life down for the sheep. So the relationship between Jesus and the church is, is, unbel is very similar to the relation close relationship between Jesus and his father. This relationship is the basis for the sacrifice that Jesus makes on behalf of, of, of uh, God's children, us. Verse 16, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the Gentiles. So the Gentiles, me and you, must be brought into salvation together with God's, uh, God's chosen, the, the, the fold of Israel. The way to eternal life is the same for both. We all must hear in Jesus the voice of God and respond with faith. So there also I must lead, and they will hear my voice. <clears throat> and there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is not, folks, this, this, all these denominations where well, you if you're not this denomination, you'll you won't go into heaven. If you're not that denomination, you'll you won't go to heaven. You need to repent and you need to submit to this denomination. Jesus is making it very clear. When we are in heaven, we're not going to be separated by denominations, folks. They're not going to say, okay, uh, Baptists over here, Catholics over here, Lutherans over here, uh, Presbyterians over there, uh, Mormons over here. That's not how it's going to happen. We're going to be one flock, one family, and one shepherd. One shepherd is the good shepherd, and a good shepherd is Christ. This does not mean, by the way, there's a lot of people that want to believe that this means there will be one flock, one shepherd. That means only, only one denomination and one person, human person, leading all that. You know what I'm talking about. It does not mean that at all. Jesus is saying that there will be one family. It is the family of God and one shepherd. And Jesus is saying he's a good shepherd. So forget all the denomination stuff. That's just preposterous. This is not elitism. Well, you don't belong to the club, so therefore you can't be a part of it. Oh, give me a break. Verse 17, this is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. All right, someone's asking our messenger, why doesn't this mean uh, uh, the Roman Catholic? Well, because it doesn't. Because Jesus is saying in the entire here in this entire reading in the gospel that he is the good shepherd. He is the one shepherd. So all of a sudden to switch and then saying, oh, by the way, there's this other shepherd here. That's not what he's saying. For this entire gospel, Jesus is saying he is the one who's the good shepherd. And they, we are all, every, the Jews and the Gentiles, all of us will be one flock with one shepherd. This has nothing to do with denominations or the Pope. This has everything to do with all of us will be children of God and we will have one shepherd. That's what this, that's what this is about. You can't introduce 
Well, Jesus is saying now there's going to be another shepherd. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. He just said he was the true shepherd, the only shepherd, the one true shepherd. So, uh, yeah, this is not about denominations. It, there's nothing wrong with denominations. I consider myself old Catholic. I love the old Catholic movement. I love the old Catholic faith. This is what we are. I love the United States old Catholic Church. I stand firmly behind it. But I also love my brothers and sisters who are not Catholics. And there's not, there's, by the way, there's more than one, there's one, there's more than one Catholic. I just want, a lot of people don't know that. There's a lot more than just one Catholic. And verse 17 says, this is why the father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. Why does he say in that? Because the only being that can raise us from the dead is God. So Jesus, once again, is declaring very firmly and clearly he's God. The crucifixion and resurrection are the two aspects of the glorification of Christ. In his exaltation, Christ takes up life not only for himself, but also for all who live through his work of salvation. Finally, this command I have received from my Father. It's it, it just a beautiful, absolute beautiful thing. And people also say, well, what about the Trinity? Well, remember, Jesus did say the Trinity, the term Holy Trinity is never actually mentioned as far as, uh, you know, the scripture is. It, 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 it's the Holy Trinity. No. But we, Jesus did say, go and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, who do you think he was talking about? <laughs> the Holy Trinity. That's where the Holy Trinity come from. <laughs> it's like, hello. So, okay. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Let's get into our my uh, re, my homily, and then we'll uh, get into Revelation. Uh, you know, this is powerful. These words in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 11 through 18. See, in these verses, Jesus speaks of himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And he emphasizes the deep love and care that he has for each one of us. So Jesus, the good shepherd, contrasts himself with the hired hand who does not truly care for the sheep. You see, the hired hand may run away in the face of danger. See, the wolf runs. See you. Bye bye. You're on your own. But the good shepherd remains steadfast, even sacrificing himself or herself to protect and save his flock. It is this selfless love and dedication that sets Jesus apart as the ultimate ex example of a, of a leader who serves with compassion, true compassion and courage. I think as we reflect on this uh, passage, hopefully we're reminded of the profound love that Christ has for each one of us. And he knows us by name. He knows our struggles and our joys. And he is always present to guide us along the right path. Just as a shepherd knows the ins and outs of each sheep in his care, Jesus knows how intimately and, uh, and desires only, uh, only our well-being and salvation. That's all. He, he just wants us to be united with him, to love other people. See, in this world filled with challenges, uncertainties, sickness, and yeah, bad things do happen to good people. Let's stop blaming God for that. Let's stop doing that. You know, I, I think sometimes we forget that that's where faith comes in. Faith truly comes in when we're going through those difficult times. It's easy to believe in God when life is good. When life is good, that's easy. But faith really comes in when life becomes difficult. That truly is when our faith is challenged. Not because I don't believe, I, and this is my belief, and you can disagree with me, and that's fine. Life is hard enough as it is. I don't think God is in heaven saying, hmm, I think James needs a few more obstacles in his way. Let's throw some more challenges down. Let's have his car burn up and let's have his, uh, his house explode and let's have him have get really sick. And let's let me just see how he does. I, I just simply do not agree with that. That would be sadistic. See, remember, Jesus 
he walked our our walk. He he lived our life. He 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 experienced how difficult life is. He knows how life difficult life is. And I don't think we have a God up there that's purposely throwing obstacles in our way. And, and a lot of people will say this to people. And I always tell people, be careful, be careful, because they don't want to hear this. N nor would I want to hear it. If I'm going through difficult time, the last thing you should say to somebody is, well, God doesn't throw anything at you that you can't handle. So someone actually said that to me uh, when my mom, when we found out that my mom had brain tumor. You know, bad stuff. And then I said, no, wait, did you just say what I thought you said? Oh, yeah, yeah. God doesn't throw any more any more at you than, than what he thinks you can handle. So God, by that statement, put a brain tumor in my mom's head because he thought he knew I could handle it. You see, that that's very, very twisted. Is he aware? Certainly. Does he allow? Certainly. But he does not will it. There's a big difference between the, the, the people get confused about that. I just disagree firmly that God is purposely throwing obstacles in our lives. I think the being that's throwing obstacles in our lives is Satan. And I think Satan gets a free pass far too often because then we get angry with God and we start screaming at God. And why is God doing this? Why is God doing this? And Satan is back there saying, keep, keep, keep on, keep going. Look at that big guy throwing up all these days. See, that, that theology is very, very troubling for me. I disagree with it firmly. God gives us the Holy Spirit to endure during those difficult times. But we're going to have it. We're going to have those days. And one day, hopefully not anytime soon, but one day I know that God's going to call me home. And probably I'm going to, you know, I could get sick. I, who knows what could happen? And I'm not going to blame God for it. I'm going to be grateful that God gives me the faith that I have to push through those difficult times. It is God that helps me through those difficult times, not God is purposely throwing these bad things in my life. See, the, the devil wants you to think that God's not there listening or, or caring, that he's up there causing all these obstacles, all these issues. We have to be careful about that. We have to remember I think we can take, we, we need to take comfort in knowing that we have a good shepherd that would never abandon us. Jesus is the good shepherd. A good shepherd does not put us, put, put, a good shepherd would not put sheep in a pen and throw a wolf in it and say, now I wonder how they're going to handle this one. Hmm, let's see. Well, Sally is running pretty good. Okay, Sally, you got that one. Oh, Joe's over here. He's not running very good. Joe, you, you need to run a little faster. Do, do you see how sadistic that is? That's not a good shepherd. That is a sadistic shepherd. That's not what God does. You see, what God does is he recognizes the devil coming at us, the wolf trying to attack us and he stands right in between us and the devil you see that's the good shepherd that's the crucifixion because the devil was offering us death the good shepherd by him laying uh, lying his laying his life on the, literally on the on the line for us granted us eternal salvation. Jesus is always there to lead us uh, beside still waters, to restore our souls, to protect us to, from harm. Jesus calls us to follow him, to trust in his guidance, to walk in his footsteps of love and service. I think we should be inspired <coughs> by the example of the Good Shepherd. I think we should strive to emulate his love in our own lives. You know, perhaps, you know, we can show love and other people, you know, laying our own lives down for others by serving with humility and compassion, just as Jesus did for us. I think the prayer for all of us is, is let us seek to bring his light and love to those who are lost, vulnerable, in need of comfort. And I hope that the, uh, that the words of John chapter 10, verse 11 through 18, remind us of depth of his love for all of us, inspire us to live out that love in all that we can do.
And hopefully we can be strengthened by his grace and guided by his wisdom as we journey together as his beloved children. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Uh, I'll open up briefly on the chat for everybody on TikTok and say hello to everybody and see how that goes. So that is uh, our... Uh, and remind, remember, everybody, we're going to be here. Uh, here's the schedule for those of you who don't know. So this Friday, we'll be here at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's our paranormal show. Uh, Saturday at 8 o'clock, it's open mic night. And then Sunday, Sunday will be right back here at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with um, a new Bible study. And Miss Wilma will be teaching our kiddos. So she teach our kids Bible study. It's just, you know, she just kind of gives her her perspective on the readings. And from so we appreciate that. Well, thank you for subscribing. OK, are you ready for Revelation, everybody? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? OK. Yeah, and we'll see. We'll we'll see how. Hopefully, you know, people will be nice. Um, yeah, surrendering to God. Uh, really, honestly, when you surrender to God, you have to. We live in a world where, if you want it done right, do it yourself. And I've had to learn. It's not. It's not been. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I've had to learn that you can't do everything by yourself, and you have to surrender. The things that you can't control to God, you have to. And I bet that's also a relief knowing that you know you don't have to know all the answers. You know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I believe that people can absolutely see. I mean, we have the Eucharist, yeah. But it's some um, when you're surrendering to God, there are a couple things that I read uh, in books, you know, in steps and guidelines. And so I, I'll give, I can give you a few pointers and then we're going to get into revelation. Um, I think the first step that we would have to do is we need to acknowledge your need for God. We can't control everything. Uh, and we have, we need a savior and we have one. Because number one, because we live in a world where it's all about, quite honestly, it's all about me. It's this meism mentality. And when you surrender your will to, uh, that, that, again, it goes to faith to a God that you cannot physically see, that you have to have faith that they're, they're, that obviously God is there. Uh, that's, um, I, I tell you, it's tough. But, but when you do this, there is a serenity to it. At least for me, it is. And I, I, my mom always told me, worry about the things you can control and you have to let go of the things that you can't. And so I, I re, I've surrendered all the things that I can't control. I surrender those to God. And it's not because I don't care. Thank you, Missy. It's, it's not because I don't care. It's because I realize I can't control it. Also, <clears throat> you might want to reflect on your beliefs. So take time. Understand what God means to you. And what does surrendering to God entail? It's not a bad thing. I think so many of us, especially in this world, we've gotten, we've been hurt. You know, we've been um, betrayed. And sometimes it's difficult to trust people. But you're not trusting a, you're not trusting people. You're trusting God. You're trusting the, the Alpha and the Omega, the, the one source that will never let you down. Thank you, Miss. Never. You have to let go of control. And that's not easy. And I believe me, I, like I said, I'm trying to learn that too. But you have to let go of control. And you, re, you have to learn to release your worries, your fears and desires to God. And trusting that, that God will, will, will bestow upon you the Holy Spirit and the strength to endure. And I, I, it's worked for me. Uh, there's there's a, also you can sp uh, seek spiritual guidance. If, you, if there's a religious leader, if there's a mentor, uh, somebody you can speak to for spiritual uh, direction, I would encourage that as well. And there, there's a term. Well, thank you, Missy. Thank you. There's a term called practice surrendering daily. What that means, basically, make a conscious effort to surrender to God every day. Letting go of your own agenda. And trusting in his wisdom and love. And that doesn't mean that you have no desires or that you don't want to be a better person tomorrow than you were today. But it means, okay, God, I'm going to follow you. 
I'm going to follow wherever, what the direction you want me to go in, and place in my heart, whatever it is that you want me to do, and I will follow you. And that's, uh, that I think that's, uh, that's at least some examples of how you can surrender to God. But it takes, uh, you know, when you're, if you're a type of person, oh, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Missy, and thank you, Lori. Uh, for those of you who have no idea, they're offering gifts on the ministry on TikTok, so I'm thanking them. Okay, Revelation, everybody. Revelation, because I have to stop at 9.30, because we have night prayer coming up at the top of the hour. And by the way, establish a prayer life with God. If you want to surrender God, you have to establish a prayer life. You have to. And we offer. Uh, we offer um, We offer that. Oh, oh, I, have a, I have a little puzzle I have to do. Hold on. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. Let me do this puzzle. There we go. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, in uh, after an hour, um, you have to do this. You have to make it. You have to make a little puzzle. Otherwise, it'll kick, kick you off. Uh, what are you going to do? Okay. Oh, you do it the three or four times? That's great. Good. Okay, everybody, let's go. Uh, tonight, we're going to return to the end of chapter 12 and revisit a few things. So as we've been learning at the midpoint of tribulation, the Lord makes a series of dramatic moves to prepare the earth for the next three and a half years during tribulation. And among those dramatic moves is the establishment of a place of protection for the believing Jews on earth who've come to accept Jesus as the Messiah. So the place of protection is called Batra or Petra. Uh, it will become a fortress uh, in the desert for the second half of tribulation. Uh, oh, thank you, Carol. Thank you. So the Lord supernaturally protects the remnant for three and a half years in this place, preventing the enemy from wiping out uh, believing Israel. Uh, remember, at the end of chapter 12, we read that. So again, I want to I want to reiterate because people are just tuning in for the first time who might have been, you know, Revelation. I take Revelation as prophecy. Some people do not, and that is fine. That's their right. But I look at it as a, prof a prophetic book, things that have not occurred yet. So I do believe in tribulation. Uh, I believe in the end of the church age. Uh, many people refer to that as the rapture or being caught up. I do believe this. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, let's, it says here, So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Christ. So remember, uh, if you were here with us on Sunday, uh, Satan is now bound to the earth. And that alerts him that his time is now short. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to do this. Uh, trolls are coming in and being nasty and hateful. It's so, you know, these people, they just don't stop. They don't stop. I, I, so sub chat only for the rest of the time. Sorry. For those of you on TikTok, I apologize, but I'm not going to have trolls coming in here disrespecting people during Bible study. Give me a break. It, it is, the, TikTok is the, only, is the biggest issue with trolls. Honest to God, I, we don't have all that problem on any other platform. TikTok is the worst when it comes to trolls. And that's the truth. So, sorry, but if you're on TikTok and if you want to chat, you have to subscribe. And that's just way because that's what it's going to be. Um, remember, at this time, Satan now, he's in panic mode. And he's, he enrages him against anyone who is aligned with God and against his purpose. So his first target are the believing Jews because, as we will learn later, uh, the Jewish people play a key part in God's defeat of Satan. And Satan attempts to end the existence of believing Jews on earth, but God will not allow the plan to succeed. Yeah, uh, we'll, I pray for them, but they don't want your prayers. But we still pray for them. That's all we do. Uh, believing Jews are protected. Remember, because God promises the Jewish nation that a believing remnant will always remain. This is one of the reasons why I believe many reasons why I believe uh, Revelation is prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 37, verse 31, it says, the surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So God promises Israel that a remnant, meaning a group of believing Jews, will always exist by God's power. 
Even Paul tells us in Romans that this has always been the case. So Romans chapter 11, verse 1, I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. I'm sorry, not uh, uh, Or do you know, or, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to knee to Baal. Uh, in the same way, there's also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, and Baal is, again, evil. Uh, it's uh, terrible. People were bowing down to this fake God. So as Paul said in Romans, the remnant of Israel is always preserved by God's grace, ensuring faith remains alive in the nation. So in Elijah's day, believing Jews were still present in the nation, despite Elijah's assumption to the contrary. So today that remnant is part of the body of Christ, the church, consisting of Jews who come to faith in Christ during tribulation. And in the tribulation, it will be the same with Jews who have heard the gospel, believed in Jesus after the rapture, or being caught up, however, whatever term you want to refer to. So the Jewish people have always and will always include a minority with saving faith called the remnant. And in the time of tribulation, God's protection takes the form of a fortress in patriot to preserve the remnant until Jesus returns. And since Satan cannot wipe out the remnant, and as it sits in God's protective custody, he must direct his anger elsewhere. So that leads him to attack two other groups who oppose him on the basis of faith. The first group Satan attacks are those who keep the commandments to, of God, which means those who maintain a faith in the Mosaic law. The commandments of God is a reference to the law of Moses. So this first group of Jews who continue to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel, uh, through the keeping of the Mosaic law. However, these Jews are not yet believing in Jesus as their Messiah. If they had believed, Scripture is very clear, they would have been included in the remnant that was delivered into Petra for protection. But because they are devoted Jews without protection, they oppose Satan on earth, and therefore they are persecuted and even murdered by Satan through human agents under Satan's control. So then we have the second group, which are those who hold to the testimony of Christ. Remember, as I said recently, uh, this group are principally Gentiles who come to uh, faith in Jesus after uh, the end of the church age occurs. And it, many, again, people refer to that as the rapture or the church being caught up. I've said it a million times, the people, you and me, who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, if, there, if that would occur, the rapture would occur tomorrow or next week or whatever, we are going to be caught up. You and me will be watching this in heaven. So stop worrying about tribulation. If you believe Jesus is the Messiah, you don't have to worry about it at all. Many Gentile believers will be attacked and martyred as a result of their faith. Remember, we've already seen evidence of their deaths in the earlier chapters of Revelation uh, as souls. Uh, remember, I've talked about that under the altar in heaven. And this may seem unfair. But remember, there's no promise from God to preserve a Gentile remnant on earth. And moreover, the plan of God for Christ's return and the, and, uh, the defeat of Satan does not depend on Gentile believers as it does for Jews in the, in the, because of the Old Covenant. So preserving a believing remnant of Gentiles on earth is not necessary to God's plan. Nevertheless, as we're going to see, a, a group of Gentile believers do manage to survive until the end. Moreover, dying is not as bad as of an outcome for those who live during the second half of tribulation, according to Revelation 14. We're going to come back uh, to that martyrdom in just a second. And also, remember, in chapter 14, we learn about yet another group that is being persecuted and does not receive protection after mid-tribulation. But meanwhile, let's, let's move forward. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and then I saw a beast coming out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast, which I 
Saul was like a shepherd, like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. So chapter 13 opens with some familiar symbols, some and even some new symbols, which tells us that a story is building and new details are being added here. So we have a remember, we have our dragon again. We know already, I've already described, I've already explained how we know this is Satan. He is confined to the earth and, and engaged in persecuting believers and Jews alike. But remember, as I said, he does his work through the agency of human beings. He controls and directs. Look, here's the deal. Uh, Satan has always worked this way, most obviously with Judas betraying Christ. And, uh, and he will do the same in tribulation. But at the midpoint of tribulation, his tactics reach a new level, brought about by his casting down from heaven. And in chapter 13 is the story of how Satan's methods change dramatically at mid-tribulation. See, that story centers on a familiar character called the beast. Now, I, I say it's familiar because he has already appeared in the book of Revelation. Remember in earlier chapters, we talked about it. Most specifically, a beast was mentioned in passing in Revelation chapter 11 as the one who killed the two witnesses at mid-tribulation. And now we will learn how it is that someone could obtain the power to defeat those two men when no one else could. And this beast also appeared in an earlier chapter in Revelation, though at, at that time he wasn't being called the beast. Remember, he was riding the, uh, the horses that opened the sealed judgments, and in those earlier references, he wasn't called the beast because he had not yet risen to a place of prominence. But now we learn in chapter 13 how that man's rise to world domination happens, and it starts with the dragon again standing on the shores of a sea and the beast rising out of the sea. So we know the dragon Satan. So the suggestion is that the beast rise to power is made possible by Satan's power. But what does it mean that the beast rises from the sea? Well, remembering our rules for interpreting symbols, we consult scripture for answer. We do not guess. We do not give an opinion based on just an opinion. And in this case, the answer comes easily. We should remember what we learned in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. And then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. And Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. So a beast coming out of the sea is clearly de uh, defined in Daniel 7 as meaning a Gentile nation, or in this case, a Gentile ruler coming into power. In fact, the use of the term beast to describe uh, this world leader is uh, it's a clear and obvious reference to uh, back to Daniel 7. So immediately we recognize that this chapter is closely tied to Daniel 7. And therefore, as we consider the symbols in this chapter, We'll look back on Daniel 7 frequently to understand their meaning. See, in verse 1, we're told that the beast of Revelation 13 has features that are very similar to one of the four beasts described in Daniel 7. And to the dragon, by the way. So the beast is like a, it's like a Frankenstein monster of other animal parts, including a lion, a bear, a leopard. So this beast also has ten horns. And seven heads, and there are ten crowns on the horns, and on the seven heads were blasphemous names. So before we go any further in understanding those symbols, we have to revisit the description of the four beasts in Daniel 7, because Daniel 7 tells us what they are. Um, I'll just Let me just do this. Hold on one second. Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, can you uh, guys hear me? I, I know... Uh, I have a uh, my air conditioning unit uh, is going. So can you just let me know if you guys can hear okay? If not, I have a little uh, microphone that I could plug in here in the future. That way you guys can hear a little bit clearer. So if you can't, uh, or if, as long as you can hear okay, that's fine. 
Okay, Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a, a lion that had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a, light, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying, extremely strong, and had large iron teeth that devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with his feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, this horn possessed eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boast. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so when we studied Daniel 7, we learned that the four beasts each represent a world dominating empire. And, um, no, that's wonderful. Yeah. So the lion represented Babylon. Okay. The bear was Medo-Persian and the leopard was Greece. The fourth beast was altogether different from multiple horns. Notice that in the description of the beast of Revelation 13, we see elements of all these creatures represented in that beast. He has features of the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the fourth unnamed beast of Daniel 7. But look, the implication is, is very clear. The beast of Revelation 13 is the embodiment of the age of the Gentiles. He is the final and most powerful leader of the age of the Gentiles, which is why he has the features of the fourth beast. And he's also the one who fulfills the overall purpose of the age, which is to hold Israel under Gentile rule until Christ's return. And at the conclusion of the beast rule, Jesus will return. And by the way, the, the beast is the final world ruler that Daniel 7 told us would end the fourth kingdom and the age of the Gentiles. So uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the 10 horns, out of his kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time, which I've already told you how long that is. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heavens will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. All right. So recognizing the connection with, uh, with Daniel seven, we can begin to form a story from the symbols opening this chapter. So remember that mid tribulation, Satan will permit a world ruler called the beast to rise to power and fulfillment of Daniel 7. Yes, I do believe in the Antichrist. Absolutely, I do. The world ruler will be the final world ruler of this age, bring Daniel's prophecy full, first, full circle. So just remember, just as the age began with one, with one dominant world ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, so it will end the same with the beast. And this man is de depicted with features of a lion, bear, leopard, because he inherits and succeeds all previous kingdoms. I thank you for the subscribing. So he embodies all that the age of the Gentiles stands for. So the, the beast rise to power is made possible by Satan's power. Remember, verse 2, we're told that Satan gives the beast his throne and great authority on earth. But notice, the dragon also gives his power to the beast, which indicates that something new is happening here. The beast literally becomes as powerful as Satan himself. And the only way for that to happen would be if Satan and the beast would become one. Now, at this point, we would want to know the meaning of the beasts, the horns, the heads, and the crowns. 
obviously they have great similarity to those of the dragon, and we might be tempted to make a direct comparison. But then we notice the arrangement of these symbols is slightly different, so that means the meaning must be different too. See, both have ten horns and seven heads, but Satan wears crowns on the heads, while the beast wears crowns on the horns. So if we follow our rules of interpretation, we find the answer is given elsewhere in the book, in Revelation 17. So rather than skipping ahead, we're going to wait for that answer until we get to that chapter. However, we're going to make, an in, uh, we're going to make interpreting the, the next verse a little tricky, you know, since it focuses on, as one of these details, the heads. See, in the next verse, we learn how it is that Satan brings this world leader to rule over the planet. Revelation 13, verse 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Ah. One of the heads of the, be of the beast is slain, but we don't know how or what the, the heads represent. So to make our study of this chapter easier, I'll simply tell you now that the slain head rep represents the Antichrist himself. When we get to uh, chapter 17, we'll unpack the meaning of these symbols very carefully. And, at, and by the way, and at that time, we're going to learn that these heads represent seven world leaders. The seventh representing the Antichrist himself. Therefore, the death of a head on the beast represents the Antichrist himself dying, being killed by someone or something at mid-tribulation. Now, that's a stunning event because it seems to run against everything that we've been learning so far. But Daniel said that the Antichrist would rise to power at the midpoint of tribulation and rule for three and a half years. And we've already learned one verse earlier that the beast would receive the power and authority of the beast. So how does his dying fit into the plan? Well, remembering during the first half of tribulation, the Antichrist begins his rise as a political and military leader. He is one of the ten world leaders at that time, since Daniel 7 tells us that he will be an eleventh ruler. This is why I tell you that, no, we are not at the end times. We do not have, I believe in prophecy, the, I believe in revelation is prophecy, we do not have the ten world leaders, world leaders at this time. We simply don't. Now we can start seeing leadership we can start looking at uh, countries and saying, now, wait a minute, this is interesting. So remember, he comes into power by negotiating a covenant to permit Israel to return to sacrifice according to Daniel 9. And he consolidates his power through threats of war and military conquest according to Revelation 6. So now we learn that as he reaches the height of his power, the Antichrist will suffer a head wound and it is fatal. And notice language in verse 3 carefully. His wound is fatal. And by definition, a fatal wound means the body dies. But then it says that his fatal wound is healed. Well, the only way a fatal wound is healed is if the body dies and then returns to life. Well, that's, and by the way, even the Greek language confirms this interpretation. So Revelation, let's go back to... Um, there are the same Greek words in Revelation chapter 5. It describes Jesus in the throne room. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 says, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamp standing as if slain, having the seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, set out into all the earth. So at that time, I told you that the phrase standing as if slain was a euphemism for resurrection. So here we find the same phrase meaning the same thing. The Antichrist is killed and is then resurrected. Now, we don't know. We don't know what kills the Antichrist exactly, but we can make an educated guess. Daniel chapter 7 told us that uh, as the Antichrist rises to prominence, he subdues three of the world leaders and becomes king of the world. So perhaps his you know, rapid rise to power leads three of the world leaders to conspire to assassinate him. They succeed, and it appears that the world is safe until the Antichrist is resurrected and then removes the three kings. But how can the Antichrist accomplish a resurrection? Obviously, that would depend on a supernatural power. So we know that God has the power to bring a dead body back to life, but in this case, he isn't the one doing the work. Instead, the Lord allows 
Satan to do something he has long desired to do. God permits Satan to indwell the body of the Antichrist, bringing the man back to life for the remainder of the tribulation. And moreover, Satan indwells the Antichrist, taking residence into the man's body. Perfect possession. And this is what verse 2 meant when it said that the dragon gives his power to the beast. Satan literally puts himself in his power inside the Antichrist, which is how he may bring the man back to life. Having been resurrected, the beast is now even more powerful than he was before. And through this union, Satan becomes the object of the world's attention and even worship. Because why? Listen, notice how the world reacts to the stunning development. Revelation 13, verse 4, they worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with them? Uh, no, uh, the Antichrist, no, the Antichrist prior to the resurrection is an evil man, a world leader. And then he passes away. He is, uh, he is but through demonic activity. He is called temptation. He does terrible things. He is influenced by Satan. He is a man and he dies. Uh, and then the, the Satan indwells within the man, is resurrected, and then people begin to worship him as God. It says in Scripture, the resurrection of the Antichrist leads the world to say, who can be like the beast and who can wage war with him? As a result, the world worships the beast. But notice also that the world begins to worship the dragon, which suggests they begin worshiping a god behind the scene. Remember, Satan is now confined to the earth. So this is his only domain now. And by taking up residence in the body of the Antichrist, Satan assumes a physical form to gain control over the entire world. So the Antichrist and the God, lowercase g, giving him his power, become the object of the world's devotion and worship. By the way, Paul told us that this was going to happen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all the power and signs and false wonders. So the one that Jesus says, that, or Jesus slays at his coming, is the one whose coming into power is done in accord with the activity of Satan. So now we see that the activity happens and Satan takes advantage of the Antichrist's death to bring about his resurrection. He's now worshiped as God, what he's always wanted to be, God. In fact, since we know that Satan has control of the 10 world leaders, we must assume that Satan orchestrated the whole thing. He's led three, uh, three kings to kill the Antichrist so that he could then resurrect the man, set his plan in motion, and now he is the true God of this world. And this is the moment when the Antichrist becomes the ruler of the world at mid-tribulation. And now we find the reason the man is called the Antichrist with a capital A. He is a man who makes the claim to be Christ on the basis of his resurrection. And John told us he's called Antichrist with a capital A because he opposes Christ and because he is indwelled by the spirit of the Antichrist. And now we see he is an Antichrist because he is a counterfeit Christ. Paul said this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Paul said the Antichrist would claim to be God and take a seat in the newly built Jerusalem temple. That's why the Antichrist, that's why the, the, the Antichrist, the human being, allowed the temple to be rebuilt so that he could take his seat. But Satan was behind this all along saying, okay, buddy, you're not going to sit there. I'm sitting there. You don't know what's happening to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discard you because you're not going to be worshipped as God. I'm going to be worshipped as God. Daniel told us to expect the same thing. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, then the king will do as he pleases and he will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will speak monstrous things against the God of gods and he will prosper until the indignation is finished. 
for that which is decreed will be done. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers for, or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead, he will honor a god of fortress, a god whom his fathers did not know. And he will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones and treasures, and he will take action against the strongest of fortress. With the help of a foreign god, he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him, him and will cause them to rule over many will parcel out land for a price. So Daniel told us the Antichrist would magnify himself above every god, speak blasphemous things. He will show no regard for the religious of the world because he will claim to be above the religious of the world. He will claim he will be claimed the Messiah. But in reality, the Antichrist will honor a god of fortress, which is a reference to the god of the, the god of the world, Satan. And with the help of this foreign god, the Antichrist will take control of the strongest world. And he will also put an end to worship of any other god or religion, so that all worship is directed to his god, Satan, and Satan alone. And in Daniel 9, we learned that his rise to power includes the ending of the sacrifice in the temple, because he alone will be the god on earth. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week, he will put a stop to sacrifice of grain offering. And on the wing of abominations, he will come. Uh, he will come one to make desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out uh, on the one who makes desolate. So anyway, what he's saying is the end of the sacrifice in the temple happens in the middle of the week. And it coincides with an abomination that makes the temple desolate. So the Antichrist stops Jewish sacrifice in the temple because he claims such sacrifices that no longer necessary because he's God on earth. He takes a seat in the temple. Paul says displaying himself as God. That is the beginning of the abomination in the temple. And it is the same moment that Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew 24 verse 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Isaiah 28 even said this, 28 verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with shield, we have made a pact. This overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by, for we have made falsehood our refuge and we have concealed ourselves with deception. Your covenant with death will be canceled and your pact with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, then you will become its trampling place. Wow. So in Isaiah 28, the prophet warns Israel that their agreement with this man of the enemy will come back to haunt them. So at mid-tribulation, the Antichrist is murdered, probably by three of the kings. And Satan resurrects their Antichrist's body. And through this resurrection, the Antichrist is, claims to be the real Jesus. He subdues the three other kings that killed him, and the other seven begins to fall in line under him, and he gains a worldwide following, claiming to be God himself. So claiming to be God, the Antichrist enters the tribulation temple, runs the Jews out, seats himself on the mercy seat, and he desolates. I mean, he destroys the temple in sacrifice there and puts an end to other worship. And now we see these turns of events fits with the events we studied in chapter 11 and 12. So remember chapter 11, the two witnesses are killed by the beast. And now we know how the beast had the power to do that. He has resurrected, he was resurrected by Satan. And with Satan indwelling him has the power to kill the witnesses. And remember the beast is celebrated for ending the terror of these men. And that would only add to the world's even more desire to worship him. So the Antichrist will be celebrated in mid-tribulation as the risen Christ and the savior of the world. He ended the terror of the judgments that the world was associated with these two witnesses. And he has established a new world kingdom under his rule with one system of uh, worship centered on him as God. And all those are confirmed in Revelation 13, verse 5. And we're going to talk about that on Sunday. For those of you on Spreaker, I'm going to say goodnight to you guys. Yep, we got to run because uh, running a little bit late. Well, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, Father Bill, if you're listening, we'll be, uh, I'll be calling you a little bit later than uh, normal. So don't panic if I call you around 950 or so. For those of you on Twitter, I'm going to say goodnight to you guys. And hopefully I'll see you guys uh, relatively soon. Folks, I tell you all the time, your value does not decrease based on someone's inability or refusal to see your 
uh, worthy, your price, and your, your love for the God has you. Remember, you are priceless. Don't let anybody tell you or convince you otherwise. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. God bless.